Hey, right now, episode 91 on the flip side. Why we don't need Pastor Kurt. Man, I'm gonna tell you what dead French philosophers have to do with the chaos on Twitter. We're gonna talk James chapter three on the flip side. Hello, my friend, Pastor Kurt here, and I am with just, uh, I know I say this every week, but it's absolutely true, one of the smartest leaders I know, Dina Davidson. Dina runs our Thrive School around here. She's a frequent guest on the flip side, and whenever you're talking about going deeper into a passage and thinking about how we apply this uh, all week long, Dina Davidson is at the top of my list. Dina, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm really okay. excited because I'm going to drink the coffee today. You're going to drink so, the wow! How adventurous not for you! Not usually on the flip side. For no, you know, but. not usually. But speaking of which, do we Haley? Do we got some coffee? The last three weeks you've been following us. The coffee post. Um, we couldn't be live in a room together. It has mm. been spectacular coffee. Much better. Yes, yeah. it's been really, really good. And I don't know if that's just because I've been tired of my horrible home coffee, or the flip side is taking it off. What do you do at home? Do you do like a pour? Over? Um, you know, I used to do an espresso, but my Nespresso machine broke. And so now I'm doing time. K-Cups again. No. Yeah, no. I am. That well, the thing is, hurt. I just don't, help him. I don't have, some, have patience. It's still brewing over here. Just okay. Give me okay, okay, okay. We'll get into it. We're in James chapter 3. And man, I'm telling you, when God asked us to go through the book of James here during the middle of all this cultural crisis and the um, amount of COVID crisis we have, I, uh, Lord, what were you doing and thinking? Because this is all really great, super relevant, and kind of tough stuff. You know, we're going to talk about the taming of the tongue. We're going to talk about uh, what you comment on Facebook, what you say to your spouse, what you say to your friend, what you say to your uh, person that doesn't vote like you, look like you, act like you, what you represent as Christianity that comes out of your face, what you represent as healthy relationship that comes out of your face, what you represent uh, as progress or constructive criticism that goes on social media in man. Do we need James chapter three? I think I've told the story several times, but I've had multiple days where I've taken a call from someone so mad at me and people that are really love and are really God honoring people, but using a tone and a language that I would not expect out of them. And then the very next phone call is on the opposite side of the same issue. Right and using the exact same tone and the exact same uh, level of intensity in the conversation. Uh, and then I'll get a third phone call and it has nothing to do with our cultural stuff. It's just someone mad at a spouse, mad at an adolescent, mad at a parent, and they are using a tone and a level that even when I agree with them, I say, well, you're actually making this worse by the way that you're saying it. So I'm just gonna start off with a big, huge question as I take a sip of my coffee. Let me see. You do have some in there. I do. That's so adventurous I, of you. I like that. Cheers. Excellent. Why are we all using such unbiblical strategies in our language nowadays? What in the world is going on with this, Dina? Okay. I actually have a theory about this. All right. You probably knew I would. Um, I think the reason we're using such an elevated pitch with everything we say is because our culture has given up on truth. Mm. And I think when you remove truth as an option, all that remains are violence and volume. Mm. The only way to make your point is to either get violent or to raise your vol volume and literally outshout the other person. And, and that actually makes perfect rational sense because what is a conversation? It is an attempt to communicate something, to convey something, and above all, to pass along your viewpoint to another person. But if I already believe that you, you know, everything you think and how you feel and how you act is right by you, why would I engage in conversation with you? The only possible thing I could want to do is to express myself. Yes. I'm not trying to change your point of view. Yes. I'm just trying to express myself or enforce my point of view. Right. And I think that's what's honestly Okay, so the apologetics today. interview is coming out, and I love it. And you yeah. and I would be total agreement on this in that we live in a romantic age, not a rational age. Totally. And so passion and volume, like you said, is is what we're using to sway each other. We've kind of um, given into a low view of debate, which right. is uh, debate is about technique. 
-hmm. Debate is about cleverness. Debate is about strategy, as opposed to debate being about exchange of real ideas. Uh, okay, but, but they explain this to me. If that, all that's true, and I think you're right, I think you're onto something there, why are people sending me so many uh, video clips? Mm -hmm. uh, people are sending me, and they're trying to make points. They're trying mm -hmm. to, I, I got it on Facebook, I got it on Twitter, and I just wanted you to know, all y'all that are sending me all these video clips, uh, I'm getting them all, I'm watching them all. Uh, I've already <laughs> seen them before you send them to me. Um, you know, and I got people sending me video clips mm -hmm. on why we shouldn't reopen our campus, why we should reopen our campus, what uh, Black Lives Matter really means, what it doesn't really mean. Wh and everyone seems to be compiling their set of evidences mm -hmm. and posting and or forwarding those in direct messages to people. If, if we're not concerned with truth, why are people trying to give me these little snippets of information? I mean, I think underlying it all, we do care about truth. Mm -hmm. And we really care that we get this right. We really care that our culture approaches how we treat people, how we treat race, correctly right that's obvious you know right. et, like there is no justice without truth and everyone fighting for justice right now really is caring about truth but the reason we can't have sit down and have a calm conversation about yes. it the reason we have to keep forwarding and forwarding and forwarding is because we know the other side's doing the same thing oh you're probably hearing this you're probably hearing that like let's make sure my point of view is heard so i think the reason ultimately is we care about truth we want to get this right but we don't have the belief that sitting down and having a rational, calm, kind, Jesus-centered conversation is actually going to convince you. Rather, we just need to make it so we've, in front of your face. Okay. Now we're really in agreement. We've given up on rational, calm, kind, Jesus-centered. Yeah. So I think what happens is you have an erosion of truth, okay? Mm -hmm. So we enter into this postmodern, um, hyper-cynical um, age where you know words are meaningless and uh words are uh you know we're really really seeing a, a working out of the postmodern idea words are just weapons mm -hmm. that institutions use that's right and we we abandon because of the cynicism of that mm -hmm. we've abandoned all civility we we literally have i mean it is exactly what you could have predicted was going to happen and postmodernism honestly like it started in a great way it started from the failure of modernism to get us certainty. Modernism said, hey, we can know the truth right. with certainty. Right. And people who were modern, you know, people in the Enlightenment age and, and post-Enlightenment age, they thought they had achieved the truth, which right. gave them the ability su to subject other people right. to their truth. Right. And so postmodernism comes along and debunks that and says, you're not certain. Look at all these other viewpoints. You, right. could, you could be wrong. Yes. So you should be tolerant of every other viewpoint. But now, ultimately, where we've landed is I can't be tolerant of your viewpoint because if I'm tolerant of your viewpoint, then you have to coexist with me. And I don't want your viewpoint right. to coexist with me. So we've literally, we have the same product as modernism, and, and it's just sad. It's, it's where we land when we give up on talking to each other. Okay, so I want to read this uh, passage, James 1, in a different way than anyone's ever heard it. And it's yeah. funny because this weekend when we preached on this, I thought of this in a, I've been studying and preaching this passage for years and I thought of this in a different way. Verse one, James three, verse one. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, mm -hmm. because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Okay, so every time I've read that, I've understood it the way everyone understood it, which is mm -hmm. uh, don't become a pastor. Right. Because when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to get a couple extra hours with Jesus where he's going to go back over your old sermons and tell you what a mess up you were. That's right. Um, and I think that's true. I think that's a good... Uh, but there is an attitude of the teacher. Not many of us should adopt the attitude of the teacher. Wow. Because when we are enforcing our point of view on other people without being a learner, mm -hmm. then we're going... Jesus is going to step in. Mm -hmm. And go, were you listening? Were you quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God? Were you doing that? Or were you in a teacher mode? Wow. I have just found the more insecure I get, the easier it is to slip in a teacher mode. That's right. My kids have a crisis. I don't want to comfort and be with them. I want to teach them and solve right. and relieve the stressor. My marriage has a crisis. I get on the teacher mode. My, uh, my, my wife has said to me multiple times, uh, we don't need we don't need Pastor Kurt right now. Hmm. <laughs> we need Father Kurt and 
Christian Kurt and Dad Kurt mm -hmm. and husband Kurt right now. Uh, it's, to me, I think the uncertainty of the postmodern question, the uncertainty of truth can't not be known, and the deconstruction of we all agreed on this one meta narrative uh, that ends up being, it, it, it does have an institutionalized version of it that can be very damaging. Mm. The over response to that is now we have a multiplicity of teachers. Mm -hmm. Everyone's a teacher. And, and then the digital disruption of social media has given everyone a platform and a yeah. pulpit to say they're teaching. Mm -hmm. No one is at, no, I'm, not, I'm being extreme now. There's very little listening, question asking, mm -hmm. and learning. And the, you know, I've told about a few of the phone calls I've received that have been difficult phone calls. I'll tell you about all the good ones. All of the good ones, and there's been a lot, have been, help me understand. Hmm. Right. Help, help me understand. Kurt, why did you guys say this? Why did you do this? Help me understand how I could talk to my friend, my neighbor, my coworker. Help me understand. I've had a lot of business people call me and say, help me understand how do I do this that it, it completely loves on my employees but keeps my business intact? Mm. How do I do this in a way that isn't virtue signaling and is sincere and isn't flash in the pan but, but doesn't stay silent? How do I do this? And I just think we have just a, severe shortage of how do I do this and a severe shortage Dina of how deeply theological it is to believe that our words have more power than we know that how we have conversations is how we set culture That's right. how we what we say you know people always say you know set the right culture set the right culture the right culture just is only defined by how are we talking to each other yeah. What would you, I just wonder, what would you say to someone specifically about social media? I'm just expressing myself. Like, this is right. my platform to express myself. Why are you asking me to limit the way I express myself? Like, this might be a super cynical time for me to ask that because I go, like, on Facebook, uh, post pictures of your cat and your dog and your niece and nephew. And right. I don't know, it's a precarious time to be a God honoring person on Facebook, not mm -hmm. saying things is saying things. Um, mm. You know, I've always just followed this rule, Dina, and I've been in two or three difficult organizational moments where uh, the body of Christ was threatened to be divided in a significant way. Mm. Christians were not responding or behaving the best way that they should. And you go, should, what should I do? How should I handle this? And I've always just leaned on the speak the truth in love. Right. So if you're going to post something what is the most loving way that you could say what you want to say or ask what you want to say That's right. that doesn't compromise the truth and that is in line with the Bible as much as possible? That's hard to get right. I haven't always gotten it right. But those two, those two benchmarks. And then the other thing I think you have to add into that, you have to ask yourself, am I a truth person Right. Or a lover person because we are we're different by our temperament. You got to explain those two because yeah. every time you do that for the Thrive School students, they're just kind of like, oh, oh my gosh, this changes I'm, my life. I'm a total truth person. I I like to speak before I think and just go. Here's what's wrong with your life. Raw. <laughs> You're welcome. And um, you know that's why I preach. And <laughs> and and I have learned to go. You know what I said right there was very true, mm -hmm. but I hurt that per that truth mm -hmm. didn't set them free because I didn't speak it in love. They didn't hear it from a place of brokenness in me and they didn't hear it from a place of empathy in me. Mm -hmm. They didn't hear it from me rooting for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they heard me winning a debate mm -hmm. with them, which is always gonna make them dive deeper into opposition, right. not come to reconciliation. So I'm a truth person. So I, what feels like a balance between truth and love for me mm -hmm. is not really a balance. I gotta add an extra 15% love usually means saying what I want to say in a question that invites dialogue. It usually means saying what I want to say in a place where people will not be shamed because mm -hmm. other people heard it mm -hmm. or saying it with the right people so they feel supported as I say it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so sometimes it's a little bit more private. Sometimes it's a little bit more supportive. But yeah. the context of where I say it is important. Now, there's, there's lovers, too. There are people that are... You know, my mom was like this. She was an adult child of alcoholic. She didn't like conflict. She had enough conflict right. in her home growing up. Mm -hmm. So whenever the truth would come up, she'd get all nervous. Everyone happy, 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 food, food, food. <laughs> and um, 
So if you're on that side, that's a great side to be on, by the way. You gotta, if it feels in the middle to you, add 15% more truth. Right. S speak your mind a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd say nowadays, everyone's addicted to, I'm gonna proclaim my truth. Mm -hmm. I put out one tweet, I'm done now. Right. I've said it. And we've gotta reinvent the art of the dialogue. So, very practically, um, like I, I have been listening and I, I have been trying to do this. And if I wanted to say like, I wanted to craft a post and I wanted to say like, churches should not reopen. How would I transform that into a question? Like, what would that look like if I was gonna call you Pastor Kurt and right. say, hey, Pastor Kurt, we shouldn't reopen church. What would it look like as a question? Yeah. Because I think, I think our culture has lost, I personally have lost the ability to listen. Right. So I need that literal practical example of like transforming it into a question. Yeah. Um, what should I tell my uh, ill grandfather about our church's a reopening strategy? Oh, that's so much better. So, you know, I was talking to Albert Tate about this and Albert was gone, you know, there's there's more issues going on than the racial issue too. There's a generational issue here. Right. So for us to go, you know, we've lost these lives. They're over 65 mostly. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you don't think about me like that when I'm over right. 65, right. which is like tomorrow, Dina. I'm an old, old man. Um, you know, there's, there is a, when, when we put it that way, there's a humanizing aspect. Right. And then also it's like any great relationship. They teach us in marriage counseling, stating your question with a yes or no answer is nowhere good as going, let's invite dialogue. So, mm -hmm. um, could we have options for people that need more social interaction and people that are very nervous about the spread of COVID? That's right. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So now you haven't said, I'm for opening or reopening. I'm, I'm on one side or another and I'm like, we're gonna go, is there a way mm -hmm. we can accommodate the needs of a variety of groups. So we're gonna to get to James 4 next week and James is gonna talk about why do you uh, fight and argue because the battles within you, the right. insecurities within you, and because you have asked God but you didn't get what you want, which is unmet desire. That's right. So we all have desires in this. My desire, uh, I'm more at risk, we want, I want more safety. My desire, I am going stir crazy, I need more social interaction, I, I wanna to learn to live with this thing, I'll put my mask on. Someone be in a room with me. <laughs> um, the great conversation to have, the God honoring language to have is going, what are your desires? Right. Are they biblical? Or what are my desires? Are they biblical? Let's have that conversation and where does that end? Yeah. That's always gonna end closer to a biblical win-win versus there's this side and that side and boom. Yeah, and another example, just to hit on another pressing moment, is um, the phrase silence is violence. Mm. I know like that phrase has been thrown around a lot. And I think transforming silence is violence into a question. One question we could ask um, literally anyone is, you know, how, how have I contributed to a world in which people are experiencing injustice? Yes. I mean, that's a question and you don't have to say yes or no, or like, I agree with that or I disagree. Like yes. it takes the pressure off. You don't know, you don't need to know exactly where you land on everything. Yes. If you know exactly where you land on everything, then that means you have stopped learning. Instead, mm. let's ask the question, like, how have I added to this injustice? Yes. Or, you know, what am I going to do yes. about this injustice? Those are questions. Yep. And you don't need to have an answer to have a great conversation with someone yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. So I've had a lot of conversations in the last couple of weeks about personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Where does personal responsibility fit in this curve? Do we have a personal responsibility to behave this way or act this way, especially in terms of whenever writing happens? And, and I'm, I'm, of course, like, I am not for the destruction of property. I'm not for the perpetuation of violence. I think uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a right that that um, uh, anger doesn't drive out anger, violence doesn't drive out violence, love vi drives out those things. But I also wanna say personal responsibility, be careful when you wield that argument mm -hmm. because it's it's way easier to go, Dina, what's your personal responsibility? Right. Than it is for me to say, right. what is my personal responsibility? As I'm asking myself, I'm a big believer in personal responsibility. I, I think I'm not gonna wait around for anyone to get me out of the messes that I was born into or that I have made myself. I'm going to go to God and say, what do I need to do? Right. I'm gonna accept Christ for myself. 
So yeah. I, theologically, I think when I sit on the judgment seat of Christ, it's not on the heritage of my family. It's not on anything but my personal surrender to the cross. So I love personal responsibility as a theological idea. Mm-hmm. But if I really am going to wield that argument, I got to go, oh, do I have a personal responsibility then mm-hmm. to keep learning about things I do not know in the area of cultural chaos, race, injustice, and even COVID. Like I have a friend um, from England. He's like, Kurt, over here, we're just talking about science. You guys are talking about elections. And he's like, I'm praying for you because it's doing this in an election year is really hard. And he's right. Instead of just going, uh, let's monitor the data. Let's right. think well about the data. And even when we get our assumptions about the data, we keep those assumptions in pencil. I have a personal responsibility to ask this question. What has been our history uh, of injustice in the area of both social and racial divide? Right. I have a personal responsibility to educate myself and learn about that. I have a personal responsibility to say this. And I would say this to people on all sides of these issues. I have a personal responsibility to express my opinions and questions in a way that invites more dialogue mm-hmm. and, and has empathy towards people. So there's certain things I can say. If I just say them, I might be true, but it decreases dialogue. And there are certain things that I say, they might be hard to hear, but if I say them in the right way and with the right empathy, they mm-hmm. increase dialogue. And right now, it seems like we're practicing the ways that decrease dialogue, and we're not, we're having a lot of unforced errors on the ways that increase dialogue. A really practical tame your tongue strategy that I've learned yes. um, that like, has helped me to increase dialogue rather than decrease it. And this is so practical, but God has taught me like whenever my heart starts racing, just to not say it. Like if my heart is racing, <laughs> that's like, so convicting, Dean. I, You've just removed half the things I've said in the last three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the situation, though. You're so, right. Like it You're was right. like the fourth time I had hurt someone really badly mm. in, in the course of a year, which is not that long, but fourth time. And I said, "Okay, Lord, what happened right before it that you could have told me stop that I wasn't listening?" And he's like, "Your heart was beating fast," mm. and I'm like, "Okay, that's my cue." Um, because I'm a truth person as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that. You like, are a truth person, especially great, in discipleship. Grace people, if your heart's being fast, you probably should say it. I'm a truth person. Come on, dear. My heart is beating fast. That means the Holy Spirit is saying, slow down, listen. You can say it tomorrow. Yeah. You can say it three years from now. It's yep. okay. Yep. Um, you're way more prone to jump the gun than to you know wait. So that's a yep. really practical one you are on truth. taming the tongue. Yeah, I, I am 110%. And you're, and you're really, really good with our Thrive students of going, oh, here's the area that's blocking you from going forward in Christ. Oh, 100%. I and don't know if you remember this, Kurt, but one time I came to you and I was like, hey, Kurt, I really messed up this relationship with this girl in our program. I just, and, he, and you know, Kurt's like, what did you do? And I said, I sat her down and I told her the three main idols she had in her life. <laughs> <laughs> and Kurt, you looked at me, you were like, well, that would take a really mature person to uh, handle that situation. Maybe just choose one next time. It's like, <laughs> I've tried to accept that advice. Like, you don't have to share all the truth that yeah. you have yes. right in the moment. So I was in a really incredible meeting with African-American pastors and white suburban pastors uh, and we're having this conversation, this exact conversation. How do we really move forward? How do we support law enforcement families? How do we actually create change? And, um, you know, I don't have to tell what they went. It's just layered and layered, and you had a bunch of COVID sauce on it. And one of the pastors who's got a long, long history uh, in Sacramento, really wise, God-honoring guy, he said, guys and gals, this is a lot like going to a counseling session for our churches. Mm-hmm. And if you go to a counselor, you say, okay, I was locked in for four months on COVID. I realized I developed some anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, And I need help from a counselor. So you go to see a counselor. The counselor listens to you for, let's say, the first session is 90 minutes. You pour out the whole story. And the counselor gets some really great insight already to the core challenges that you have. And they say in the last five minutes of that first counseling appointment, Okay, so I see generalized anxiety disorder. I see a little obsessive compulsive in here and your family of origin has got three or four majorly horrible things. This is gonna take you three years to get out of this. And by the way, you're very screwed up. (laughs) They don't say that. They don't do that. (laughs) 
That's not how they do it. Yeah, intentionally. That's not how they People do it. People would run. They go, I think what you said about anxiety today is very interesting. We should explore that more next mm -hmm. week. It's good. And now here's what they also don't do. They also don't go, man, that's going to be too much trouble. And uh, don't book him for another counseling appointment. Right. Uh, we're just going to deny that. And um, so Haley's creeping off from his, the, the, Dina, I didn't even ask half my questions I had for I'm you. I'm so sorry. Uh, so let me, let me go back to the, something you said in our last five minutes. Um, so much great stuff in this thing. So he says, first of all, he has three metaphors in there. Mm -hmm. Two of them are small little things like a horse's bit mm -hmm. that create direction. So our words really do determine our direction. I think that's true for our families. It's true for our businesses, true for our church. It's true for our nation. Right now, way, the way we're talking to each other is so important. And then he, t the other metaphor he uses is a, a little spark. Mm -hmm. So two of them are, hey, your words are setting your direction. And one of them is, your words are causing your destruction. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and this is where he, James is kind of a melancholy truth teller too. He goes, and by the way, we can domesticate all these other animals and we can tame them. Yep. And we can make them do our bidding and our work. And with the tongue, it's impossible. It cannot be tamed. Mm -hmm. it's exciting and encouraging <laughs> exactly. guy. So they determine your direction. They destroy everything. And it's impossible to change them. How do we actually tame the tongue? That's a great question, Kurt. Thank you for setting me up. Um, first of all, I'm excited because I can't tame the tongue. Yeah. So that makes it really easy for me to confess to Jesus. Um, I failed again. You said I couldn't do it and I didn't do it. So it makes my confession easier knowing that literally I have not the power to tame my tongue. Mm. But we're still commanded to tame our tongue. So there must be a way we can do it. And I think like every part of the Christian life, the secret is it has to be the Holy Spirit within you mm. taming your tongue. The more you surrender your heart, your life, your soul, your spirit to Jesus, the more he overtakes you and he controls the words that come yes. out of your mouth. And the way the passage ends is, you know, it says that you can't produce fresh water from a salt pond. Right. And so too, if I have sin inside of me, it's yep. gonna come out of me. That's right. And so the only way to make sure sin does not come out of me is to fix the sin within me. That's right. And so that's why I have to ask Jesus, would you not just make me not say racist things? Would you make me not be a racist person? Would you take every ounce of sin and prejudice and, and not treating other people like I want to be treated? Would you take that and remove it from me and replace it with your love, your kindness, your grace, and your belief for people? And I think that is the only way to tame the tongue, obviously. It has such a, to be God. Such a good answer. You know, the metaphor he uses is all of these different animals have been tamed, mm -hmm. but the tongue cannot be tamed. Right. So who tamed those other animals? That's good. See? So, there. you know, the bird does not tame the bird. The horse doesn't tame the horse. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the, it is a complete and total submission of our wildness. Mm -hmm. And at Kurt Harlow, I got some wildness. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've, I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again. Everything I've talked about on this podcast, I'm applying to me, I'm preaching at me, we're talking about us, and we hope some of the shrapnel hits you because we do live in a time where our words are determining both our direction and our destruction. And I just wanna encourage you be a person of God-honoring words in this next week. Say things that increase the dialogue and demonstrate your learning attitude. No matter where you are uh, on any of these issues, whether it be uh, co a culture of chaos and injustice or it be COVID or, boy, there's a, just a bunch of personal ones too in our family. I want you to be a person that lets God tame your tongue. The Holy Spirit will help you out in this. Mm -hmm. He is the tamer of tongues. Um, next week, we're gonna talk about conflict. We're gonna get into James chapter four. Um, Dina's heard me do this many, many times. It's my favorite piece of literature anywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere on the issue of how to actually turn conflict into an opportunity. We have a great opportunity with our kids, with our coworkers, with our parents, with our culture right now to take this conflict and turn it into an opportunity if we understand the battles within 
and we understand our unmet desires just the way James lays it out. There's a whole bunch more in chapter four. So definitely this weekend, BaysideOnline.com, pick your campus, BaysideOnline.com, come to a service and get that service, whether it's bricks or clicks, digital or on-site, BaysideOnline.com. Uh, on Saturday, the 4th of July, we are going to be meeting in the morning at the Granite Bay campus. You want to come for that special 10 o'clock service, you can. We will broadcast at 445. And then do me a favor. Would you like, subscribe, and share? Now more than ever is the time we need to be steeped in the truth and love of the Word of God, not just on weekends. Don't let this digital disruption keep you from the Word of God. Like, subscribe, and share. And thanks so much for watching The Flipside.